Greetings, everyone. Um, thank you for attending the 360 Road to Home Ownership Session 2. I am pleased to extend a warm welcome to you for the second session of the Spring 360 Road to Home Ownership Series hosted by the Houston the City of Houston Housing and Community Development Department. I am Latasha Smith, serving as the Community Involvement Coordinator for the Communications and Outreach Division. The HCD is dedicated to assisting community members in navigating the complex home buying process more effectively. Tonight, we are continuing with the 360 Road to Home Ownership Series with Session 2, Building the Perfect Team. During tonight's um, discussion, we will emphasize the significance of assembling a team of skilled business professionals who prioritize your needs as, as you embark on the journey of home ownership. We are privileged to have two distinguished presenters from Mitchell Realty and Chase Bank joining us on this evening, bringing a wealth of experience and information. Before we proceed, I would like to address a few housekeeping matters. First, please ensure that all audio is kept muted during the presentation. Next, Kindly submit any questions using the chat box function. Our speakers will address them during the question and answer session. And lastly, please be informed that this event is a recorded event. The recording and the presentation will be accessible to all participants post event. So now we will get started and we will proceed with our agenda coming from our community liaison, Ms. Dejanae Jones. Thank you, Latasha. Now to the agenda, introduction of our director and outreach staff, a mini fair housing commercial, introduction of today's guest speakers, licensed realtor, excuse me, Mitchell Realty and community home lending officer, Chelsea Bank, then to our upcoming events and final remarks. Thank you, Deja. I would like to introduce our director, Mr. Keith W. Bynum, and I would like to introduce the outreach team. Myself, I'm Onika Porter. I'm the administrative manager. Latasha Smith is our community involvement coordinator, and Deja Nae Jones is our community liaison. The Fair Housing Act prohibits housing discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and familiar status. If a landlord refuses to rent to you because of your service animal, the language you speak, or the color of your skin, you may have been a victim of housing discrimination. If you feel that you have been discriminated against, call the Department of Housing and Urban Development at 1-800-669-0777. Want to learn more about fair housing rights? Call the Fair Housing Hotline at 832-394-6240. All right, we are now up to our presenters for this evening. Um, first, we have Miss Lisa Diaz. She is from Mitchell Realty. She is a licensed realtor. Um, I, there is so much that I can say about Lisa. Um, Lisa has been with me for um, from the beginning of this um, series. She is a faithful, faithful, dedicated, licensed realtor. Um, any question that you have, um, she can answer it. So I am honored to have her here again tonight um, for um, to speak to you on behalf of a realtor. One thing I must tell you, part of our, um, the city of Houston, um, down payment assistance program, they highly, highly encourage you to get a realtor. Um, the, the position that Lisa will um, propose today 
is to tell you about a realtor, what a realtor does, and also she will give you information if you're interested in her being your realtor. So definitely get your papers out, your pens, get ready to take some good notes. And once Lisa is finished, I will be back up to introduce our next presenter. So now I give you Ms. Lisa Diaz. Thank you, Latasha, for that warm welcome. As she mentioned, we are all dedicated to helping you on the 360 Road to Home Ownership. So what we're going to do today is to give you some pointers, some steps to get you guided on your first, on you know, your journey to buying a home. I know at first it seems daunting. You think, I can't do it. Where do I start? And there's so many questions going through your mind. That's what we're here to do, to help you simplify that process and give you the steps that you need to take to begin your journey. So like she said, get your notes ready and we're gonna get started. So I'm gonna share my screen. Give me just a quick moment. Okay, can you see it? Can you see my screen? Oh, let's see, did I log out? No. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I, just, I thought you did it. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I thought maybe I had lost you. All right, so here we go. Yep. The keys to home ownership, your guide to buying a home of your own. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Lisa Diaz with Mitchell Realty. So always remember, you can do it. As I mentioned, these steps, they seem daunting, and you just don't know where to begin. And that's where Dee, Dee and I and Latasha and her team are going to help you begin the steps. So uh, right now, you might be renting, and you really want to purchase. So we're going to go over some some of the questions you have versus buying or renting. So one of the, so some of the pros are with buying is it, it provides you long term security. You don't have to move. The lease doesn't expire. You will always have that long term security in your home, and it also helps you establish generational wealth. Some of us have had our grandparents or parents pass on a home to us. So that's something that you can do for your families. You can establish generational wealth when you purchase a home. You can also build equity as you continue to pay your mortgage. And I know some of these terms might sound unfamiliar, and that's okay. We'll, we'll go over them in just a moment. But it helps you build equity as you, as you, when you buy a home. And what that means is, say, for example, if you buy a home for, let's say, about $200,000, and with time, over the course of time, that how the home can appreciate. So that home you purchased, let's say, maybe five years ago, or in 2024, in 2028, it might be worth $20,000 more, right? So that's how you, you build equity in your home. You also have created control over your living space. You don't have to ask anybody permission. You add equity and wealth, again, as I mentioned, as the home value increases. And you have the option of renting out your home in the future if you so wish to, to do that and maybe even purchase another. So some of the pros with renting is that you can relocate anytime. There's no commitment to the mortgage. You have a low credit score. It doesn't always preclude you from renting and the landlord is responsible for maintenance, property tax, and insurance. But Again, what we're looking at is the pros of buying. So are you ready to buy a home? So some of the things that you can take into consideration when you're ready, if you're ready to buy a home are is to be informed about your credit. And if you have questions about your credit, I'm here and Didi's here to, to be able to answer your questions about credit, or we can refer you to somebody that can answer more detailed questions about your, your credit score. Choose your home team. Consult with your real estate agent. I would be glad to help you with this journey, but it doesn't have to be me. It's somebody that you can trust to help you build your perfect team. Get pre-approved for a home. And then once you get pre-approved for a home, which is DD or any lender can help you with, then you will begin to search for a home. And then you make an offer. Once you make an offer in a home, you negotiate and sign the contract. It goes into escrow. You remain steady and you have your final loan approval. So now we're going to go over what these steps actually mean. So another thing to always remember, it's never too late. It's never too late whether you're in your 20s or whether you're in your 60s. It doesn't matter. It's never too late to buy a home. So don't let that be an obstacle when you're considering purchasing a home. So credit score, wouldn't go over it. You have the option to go to www.annualcreditreport.com. You want to jot that down in your notes. And you can pull from one or all three of the credit bureaus. And that'll kind of give you an indication of what's on your credit report. And it's free. 
at last time I checked, you could ch check them uh, each about once a month. Before it was like once a year, and it, it might have switched back, but you do have the option to check one of or all three of the credit bureaus. Credit is important when buying a home, but here's the but. The but is we think that we might have to have 700 credit score, uh, 750, a high 600, when that is not the case. Sometimes you can buy a home with as low as 585, somewhere around that credit score. So those are not, don't let that preclude you from thinking, I cannot buy a home, my credit's terrible. Also, it was important to take into consideration is that when you buy a mortgage, which is the loan, that's what's called, the loan is called when you purchase a home. When you're buying a mortgage, when they pull your credit, it's different from when you're actually trying to purchase credit for, let's say, a car or a credit card. It's totally different criteria. So if your credit, like say on Credit Karma or one of those things that tells you your credit scores let's say 520, that might not matter to a lender because they use a different scoring model. And then uh, if you, if, once you start working on your credit or you have excellent credit, if you have good credit, it can lower your interest rate. So again, it's not necessary to have excellent credit. And, and so again, don't forget to check www.annualcreditreport.com or a lender can also help you with pulling your credit as well. Okay. So choosing your home team. So there are four people that are going to help you with when, you, when you're purchasing a home. So the first one is the real estate agent. So what are some of the things that the real estate agent can do? They can, they're going to help you draft and deliver documents. And I know it's really easy nowadays to just get your phone, look, look for a home and say, hey, I like these five houses. Can we go take a look? Well, the difference is, is that what a real estate agent can come and do and help you is that they can pull up the comps for the area. So say, for example, you find a house, you say, hey, I like this house. I'm going to go take a look at it. And and it's, let's say the house is, is two, $250,000. But an agent, what they can do is pull up the sales for, in the past six months. And they can they can tell you, oh, I know this person has a house for 250000 but actually the sales for the last six months, they're only selling for about $200,000. So this person is in the market really kind of like on the high end. So maybe we should offer closer to maybe like the two, lower 200s because that's what the market's indicating that it's willing to bear. So those are that's an important factor when you're choosing a real estate agent to make sure that they do that kind of research for you so that they can help you make a, a wise and informed financial decision. So negotiate on your behalf, as I mentioned. That's one of the things. Some of the things that I've helped my clients do in negotiating, if, for example, when uh, a recent client of mine, they were first-time home buyers like yourself. They're young in their early 20s with a, with a toddler, and they purchased a home, and I helped them negotiate 10, about $10,000 in closing. And actually, when they close, they actually receive money back instead, instead of having to bring uh, closing uh, money to the closing costs to the table. They receive money back. So those are some of the things that your realtor can do for you is to help you negotiate closing costs so that that way it can uh, it, 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 you won't have as much of a burden when you're purchasing a home and you can use that money instead to furnish your home. Okay, so coordinate appraisals and inspections. So when you're purchasing a home, you definitely, I highly recommend, it's not necessary, but I do consider it necessary, and I would definitely recommend you do the same thing too, is to get a home inspection. That way the home inspector can go in there and tell you what's going on with the house, and we'll get to his role, his or her role in a moment. But that's something that the realtor can do as well, is to coordinate an inspection for you and then search open listings to find properties. That's some of the other things that an agent has access to. They have access to an MLS database where they might see things that might not easily pop up for you. And they can do like a perimeter search, a, a proximity search, like say you want to be close to your job or close to your school. So some of, there's some more detailed things that a real, real estate agent can do for you. And let's see, they stay current with real estate market. The real estate market trends and best practices. So make sure it's always, I highly advise you get an agent that's experienced and that knows. Now, now granted that everybody needs their start as well, right? And so it, I wouldn't, I'm not saying don't go with a new agent, but def, experience definitely does matter. 
So the next person on your team is the title company. And what does the title company do? They issue what's called a title policy. And what they do with a title policy, they go and see if there's any liens, encumbrances on your home. So say, for example, you're buying a home from somebody and you, you don't use a realtor or anything like that, and you don't use a title company, and person A sells you the house. Well, let's say five years pass, and this person comes knocking on the door, and, and they say, hey, what are you doing in my home? And you tell them, well, I bought the house, and I have the paperwork right here, and they're like, no, this is my paperwork, you know, and, and this is, I own the home. And so if you had a title company, there's some things like that going on with a title company can do. And what a title company can do is research who owns the home, if there's any liens. And allow me to give you another example. Say, for example, you bought a home again, not using a title company. And so they couldn't check if there's any liens on the home. Person A sells you the house. And let's say they remodeled the entire house, but didn't pay the contractor. They sold you the house. And then next thing you know, let's say they did $50,000 in upgrades in the home. And then the con contractor gives you a mm -hmm. call on your phone. Hey, uh, Mrs. Smith, I, I noticed that you purchased the house and you owe me $50,000. She's like, no, I don't. I didn't do the work. I purchased it like that. I said, well, there is a lien on the home and you're the new owner. So now that lien is on your home and you're the owner. So it's, I definitely recommend that if you choose not to use a realtor at least purchase a title company. I mean, not purchase, utilize a title company when you're purchasing a home so that they can look up any liens and occurrences on the house uh, and the home that you're buying. And so let's see, the escrow officer at the title company, they also hold any money and documentation that's related to your real estate transaction. So the title company also records the deed, the mortgage and other documents with the county. The loan officer, they are very important to your real estate team. And they're gonna they're the ones that are gonna help you with your financial transaction. And I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but I'm trying to be as clear as possible so that you again can make the best financial decision that you can because this is a long-term commitment and we're here, we're here committed to you as well. So the loan officer, what can what are some of the steps that the loan officer can do? And I'll be here. I'll be brief here because I know DD will be more detailed with you about the loan officer role. So what some of the things they can do is analyze, analyze them, analyze your credit and your financial status and get your, they're going to get copies of your documentation, your financial records, and you're going to submit all your paperwork to her and then that, that the loan officer will help you in the process and getting pre-approved for a loan. And the other person that's very important on when you're choosing your perfect home team is your home inspector. Even if you decide to purchase a new construction home, that's something I still recommend. You think it's brand new. What could be wrong with it? We're, we're humans. We make errors. So I highly recommend whether it's a, a home, it's a resale home, or if it's a brand new construction home that you get a home inspector. And what they can do is they're going to perform mm -hmm. thorough property inspections. They're going to evaluate home for any compliance and regulations. Flag specific repairs that might be needed and estimate the sometimes you have you have home instructions that kind of give you an estimate about the potential cost to complete repairs. But you definitely want to do a thorough inspection when you're when you're purchasing a home. So here's not, another one of my always remember. Teamwork makes the dream work. I know you've heard that many times, but it really is true. When you have a team working for you, it's gonna help you accomplish your dream of purchasing a home. Okay, so the consultation, what are some of the things that I as your agent or any realtor that you decide to, to choose? What happens in your first meeting? So what you're hoping to do is get a five-star service from your realtor because, again, this is a big commitment. It's one probably going to be one of the biggest financial decisions in your life. So you want to make sure that you're receiving a five-star service and they're committed to helping you and gather, gather a detailed list of your wants and also your needs, and to examine your long-term and short-term goals. So here's your checklist. So some of the che some of the things that are going to be on your checklist are the location where you want to move, the, your budget, like what you want your mortgage to be, that'll be comfortable so it can help you sleep at night, the amenities in the home, the size of the property, and if schools are important, the quality of the schools, the taxes and cost of living, because to keep, something to keep into consideration are taxes. Sometimes with these newer subdivisions, 
their tax rates a little bit higher. So that affects your, your mortgage. And then also too, if there's a homeowner's association, I know some of you prefer to live in a homeowner association and some do not. So that might be something that's on your wish list, whether to have an HOA or not. Okay, here's another always remember, one step at a time and you will get there. It begins with even just a baby step. You can start now and maybe let's say you don't wanna purchase until next year. Well, if you can start now and start taking those steps, so then let's say if you wanna start purchasing in January, you'll be ready by the time January comes around. So remember, one step at a time and you will get there. Okay, so what happens in the pre-approval process once you actually start to talk to with your lender? They're gonna ask for your proof of income. So these are some of the things to write down, your proof of income, your proof of assets, your employment verification, the proof of your identity and your credit score. So what happens when, you, when we go out searching for a home and you found the home, you said, Lisa, this is it, this is my home, this is where I see all my, my memories happen, this is where I can decorate, this is, this is it, this is my home. So what happens is that I negotiate on your behalf, I submit an offer, and, and then we go back and forth, and once that offer is accepted, then it becomes, and you sign and they sign, it becomes an executed contract. Then the next step is that you have what are call your earnest money and your option fee. So your earnest money is telling the seller, hi, Mr. Ms. Seller, this, uh, this is your home, and this is me giving you money in earnest, letting you know that I'm serious about purchasing your home. And it's typically about 1% of the purchase price. And the option fee, what is the option fee? So you have a window, which is negotiable. It could be three, five, seven, 10 days. It could be one day. It could be zero days. But let's just say we're going to go with five days. And in those five days, it's a, you give, let's say, $100. And in that, within those five days, that's when, we, when I help you go out and do, make sure your inspections are done. If there's any repairs, you, you, we'd say, oh, well, you know what? The electrical box is out of code. There's a leak in the restroom. I go back and let the sellers know they, they need these things repaired or we're not going to purchase or let's negotiate the price or let's give a concession to help us purchase those things once we close. And that's what option, happens during the option period. And then, again, that's where you do your inspection as well during the option period. Okay, so once it's under escrow or in contract, these are this is like the timeline that happens. You get your financing, you do your inspection, then you have a survey to give you an outline of the land and let you know where things are, what what where your home is within the boundaries of the, of the land, right? Then you have your appraisal. The bank sends out an appraiser and tells you what the value of the home. So here's another reason why it's good to have a realtor on your side. So say, for example, you do decide to purchase that house and say, remember the sellers were saying, or in the 200,000, you're like, I love this house. And they're selling it for 250,000. This is my dream home. I want it, doesn't matter that the house has been selling for 200,000. But the bank comes out and they, they tell you, buyer, the house is really, the value of the house and what we're willing to lend you is only 210,000, not 250,000. So that's what a, an important role of the realtor is they go back to and negotiate with the seller, the listing agent, and let the sell, listing agent know that the appraisal came back, it's only $210,000. We're not going to pay 250. The bank's only willing to lend us 210,000. So that's when the negotiation happens. And then it just depends on what the buyer and the seller agree to. But again, that is an important role of the realtor is they help you negotiate and make those smart financial decisions. The title commitment, that's where the title company gives you that. It's like insurance. Letting you know that, hey, we're doing all the, our due process, making sure there's no liens and encumbrances. And if there is, you have title insurance to help you in the event that something like that happens. You also get a your homeowner's insurance and the underwriting continues with your lender. Okay, don't lose focus. What are some of the do's and what are some of the don'ts? So do, do stay the course. You're gonna schedule your utilities, turn your lights, your gas, your water, gas if you have it, gather your moving supplies, ask your lender. This is very, very important because this has actually prevented sometimes people from buying. Is to ask your lender about moving money or using any credit. So one time I had a buyer 
um, buy something on the last day of closing, on the last day of closing, and she put it on her credit, the lender checked her credit and told her you are no longer qualified because now you exceeded your debt to income ratio and you can't purchase. So she went this whole entire time supposed to move in. She didn't. So that's a, another role of your of having a good team of your lender and your realtor because they're going to help you make sure you stay on track and accomplish your goal of purchasing a home of your own. Some of the don'ts: don't buy a vehicle. Now, you know, during this time period, unless you talk to the lender first, don't use your credit cards unless you talk to your lender first. Don't open uh, or close credit unless you talk to your lender first and don't withdraw deposit large sums unless you talk to your lender first. So contingency in this period, contingencies have been removed. That means that if there's any holes on on anything that needs to happen uh, with your paperwork, paperwork submitted, survey and appraisal are completed. Okay, these are the words that you want to hear. This is means you're, you're getting so close to closing. And these are the words that all buyers want to hear is that you have the clear to close. And what does that mean? That means that you have the final loan approval. You've done all the hard work. You, you saved the course. You submitted your paperwork. You kept your credit good and ready for a final approval. You continue to make your own time payments. And the underwriter has said you've approved all conditions. You're now ready to purchase the home of your own. So on closing day, what happens on closing day? On closing day, here's another something to keep in mind about having a realtor, a good realtor with experience or somebody who's very thorough on your site. So there was a one time where we're the in the final walkthrough, it was a story I heard with a with an agent. And they did a walkthrough. We had that freeze. I, I can't remember now. Maybe it's about a year or two ago. Remember when it got really cold? And they purchased the house. They had it under contract during the freeze. They went through the walkthrough and then they they closed on the house. Well, then the, the buyer moves in a couple of days later, turns on the water, and guess what? The pipes burst and it flooded everywhere. But guess what? They're the, the buyers are now the new homeowners. And guess who has that responsibility? The new homeowner. So now they have to bear that cost. And what I learned in in that lesson of hearing that story is once I do a walkthrough with my clients, we turn on all the water. We turn on the sinks, we turn on the tubs, we turn on the hose, everything just to make sure. I mean, things happen, right? You try to be as thorough as possible, uh, but sometimes the accidents happen that you're not aware of. But we, I try to be as thorough as possible with my clients to make sure things like that are, are tried. We try to catch them before we close. That way, if a pipe did purse while we opened it, guess what? The, the current sellers, that's still their home and that's still their responsibility. And you're not, you, you're not committed to buying that house because that's not what you agreed to, to purchase it in that condition. So what to bring at your closing day, your certified funds, your photo ID, and the biggest smile on your face. So in funding, the lender reviews the signed loan documents and wires the funds to the title company. Here's another always remember. It's possible. It's not impossible. It's possible. You just have to take the first step and have a great team on your side. Okay. So now you've accomplished your dream of home ownership. The home is funded. You get the keys and you take position of your home and you walk in the front door and you say, this is mine, I did it. So to, we're gonna sum up the benefits of hiring a real estate agent. The number one reason to hire a real estate agent is that all, all services are, are to you, to you only as a buyer's agent. Here's another thing to keep in mind when you're looking for a home, again, it's very easy to pick up your phone and say, oh, I found a house. I did it on my own, 123 Main Street. Hello, uh, Mr. Mr. Hello, agents. I see your house, 123 Main Street, and I want to purchase the home, right? There, you see they listed the pictures and everything like that. But here's something to keep in mind. That agent, even though you contact, contacted them and they're speaking to you, they actually represent the seller. So it is their fiduciary, what we call fiduciary duty is to represent the seller at above all else, right? Because you're not their client, the seller is. So it's highly advisable that you hire a realtor to represent you as a buyer because that, that agent's going to help you 
purchase a home and they're going to make sure that your interests your interests are protected above the sellers. So you actually have two agents. You have the, the listing agent for the seller, the buyer's agent for you. So again, yes, it's very easy. And yes, an agent that has the house listed can help you, but they're just going to help you at the minimum level. They can't negotiate for you. They can't help you with any of those things. They can answer your questions, submit your paperwork, but they're not going to tell you, oh, yeah, well, the seller's willing to pay $20,000 less, but if you want to offer full price, go ahead. Whereas a buyer's agent will help you do your homework, negotiate, and make sure that you get the, the price that, that that's best for you. Another benefit of hiring a buyer's real estate agent is they do have a thorough understanding of the contract complex process. And again, I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but these are some of the key points I just want to kind of help you keep in mind, for example, when you're thinking about purchasing a home. Here's a, one of the con contract things that I'm, I'm speaking about. So in that option period we're talking about, let's say you did a, an option period, you're doing everything on your own and or the other agent, the listing agent's helping you. Let's say on, uh, the, let's say April, let's say we're in March, let's say March, 21st your option period ends right you're like oh i have all day march march 21st to negotiate any repairs and so now it's six o'clock you go back to the agent say hey uh agent listing agent i would like for you to repair the the um plumbing and i'm uh, then i'll continue to purchase well guess what at 5 p.m on march 21st after that fifth day that you negotiate to have your option period the time expires, but you wouldn't know that as a, you might not know it as a buyer that there's actually a time you think that maybe you have the whole, whole, whole entire, entire day, but actually there is a time limit on your option period and it ends at 5 p.m. to however many days you negotiate, three, five, seven, 10 days. On the, let's say it's 10, on the 10th day at 5 p.m., your, your time expires, so you can't negotiate it and you gotta decide, am I gonna purchase? with a plumbing issue or not. So again, another benefit of hiring a buyer's real estate agent. Another benefit, they help you make an educated buying decision. They match the criteria that you're searching for. They can also help you qualify for any doubt payment assistance to programs, such as the city of Houston or any other programs that are out there available to you. And they will assist you on your 360 road to home ownership. And they can also help you negotiate intensely on your behalf to get help you get the most value for your hard earned money. Now, for me, what is my guarantee to you? You are my priority. So my goal is to educate, empower, and elevate you as a home buyer with the knowledge to help you make wise financial decisions when purchasing your home to ensure that the home buying process is as uncomplicated because it is co complicated, but to help you help me help make it as uncomplicated as possible yes, by sir. explaining What's what going each on? step entails, and to encourage an um, open line of communication uh, and to help you become that. a successful yeah, homeowner. Yeah, I... Okay, so to begin the journey, if you'd like to take out your phone, that should lead you to my contact information. And Always remember, it's my last one, together we can, or together with your real estate team of your choice, together you can. And I'm Lisa Diaz with Mitchell Realty. I thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate it. And we're all here for to help you on your home to road to, on your road to home ownership. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lisa. All, as always, an uh, excellent presentation. Um, but Lisa, I have a question that yes. some people may uh, want to know. Mm -hmm. If um, do you have to pay for your services? Mm -hmm. So I know some things that have, things have changed and recently with what the NAR, uh, what's going on with the NAR. But right now, I haven't had any issues so far with this, the list the sellers still paying for the buyer's commission. So that's something that we will discuss with the buyers and, and if that ever comes to it. But so far, so good. The listing agents, the excuse me, the sellers are still helping the buyers agents help so that they pay their commission so that we can continue to help buyers but that's a conversation i guess that would come across and say for example if it's a if it's a fee 
that I can look up and see if there's no fee offered. And that's something I would definitely have a conversation with, with the buyer, but so far so good. It hasn't been an issue yet. All right. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. You're welcome. That is awesome. Um, so we're just going to move ahead. Um, our next presenter, if you could just bear with me as I put up the screen um, for our next presenter. She comes from, um, from Chase Bank. Her name is Dee Dee Williams. She is a community home lending advisor from Chase Bank. So if you would, just like you did, Ms. Diaz, give her your undivided attention. And this is her first time with us, and we definitely want her to come back. So um, please give her your undivided attention. And now I'm going to give this over to Ms. Williams. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I am very excited to be here. Um, it is my first time being with you guys, and I, I'm somewhat excited. I will say, Lisa, you did a very deep dive of <laughs> her presentation. It was amazing. She covered a lot of really good information. So I will say this. My presentation is not going to be as long. It's going to be a high-level overview of the um, under well, not underwriting, the home lending process. I'm going to save some time, a lot of time for you guys to ask questions, but overall, you'll hear some of the information is repeated. So, and just to warn you, I do apologize, but that means, you know, the information is accurate if both of us was pre is presenting the same exact information to you. I am also going to be off screen for a little just so I can see my screen. So if you don't see me, I'm here. Just listen up. And also I'll be here to answer questions for you guys afterwards. The first thing I want to say to everyone who's attending this evening is definitely congratulations. Congratulations for taking that first step in deciding I want to be a homeowner and I am going to attend these workshops. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be taking notes. I'm going to be aware of what exactly I'm getting into. Because if you think about it, in our life frame, in our lifetime, buying a home is really the most important, ex largest purchase item that we make. Normally, some people it's different, but on average, buying a home is a big deal. So you being here this evening instead of somewhere, something else, maybe at the rodeo doing something else shows just how serious you are about not only your financial future, but the legacy because buying a home and only real estate, by the way, is the quickest way to build generational wealth. So you're not only investing in yourself this evening, when you purchase that home, you're investing in the legacy that you leave your family. So for that, congratulations to all of you guys. Now, the first thing I wanna talk about in terms of the home buying journey is gonna be the tools that we have here at Chase. Um, and, and some of these tools you're going to find elsewhere, but one of the things I want to tell you, Chase has over $80 million, 80 million customers nat nationally. More than likely, you probably have some kind of a Chase product in your, in your life, whether it's a car loan or, you know, a credit card, something like that. You're more than likely a Chase customer. But the great thing about these tools that we have they're available not just to Chase customers, but to everyone. We have tools that would help us with deciding like how much can you afford? There are calculators that you can go in, plug in your debt, plug in your income, and that's gonna calculate for you your debt to income ratio. That's gonna let you know how much home you can actually afford. And then you're able to say, okay, I don't just wanna buy a home but I really know how much home I can afford. And one of the things, side note, I will tell you, when you start this process, when you're by yourself and you're at your home, one of the things you wanna do is get a pen and paper or a notebook. If you're not comfortable with writing, take a voice note on your phone, have some kind of organization. Yes, I see you, Garrett. <laughs> have some kind of organization to what you're about to do because it's a big deal so 
as I said, first thing, your pen and paper and some of those questions that you're going to be able to do by logging into chase.com or some kind of website where it's the all the information is there for you. One of the things, and I'm going to speak to Chase because that's what I know, but let's be realistic. BOA has this, Wells Fargo has this. They have tools where you can find out what's your credit score. Go online, find out what your credit score is. Once you know what your credit score is, you can now start, okay, here's my credit score. Let's say for this example, it's 720. You start plugging in numbers on chase.com. This is my debt. This is my income. Now you know this is my debt to income ratio. That's going to start telling the system how much home you can afford. Now you have a number. You plugged in that number and it says you can afford a home that's $325,000. Well, one of the things I'm going to tell you is just because the system says you can afford a home that's three twenty-five, dollars maybe you know, well, I just want a home that's two eighty, dollars and that's okay. Now you write it down and say, looking for a home that's 280. I know I can qualify. I believe I can qualify for up to 325. You're writing that down. Now, what do you do? Do you pick up the phone and call your realtor? I wouldn't say you do that yet. Would you go to an open house? Don't do that yet. You just have information. But what do you do with this information? On your screen, you're seeing it says, give yourself an advantage and then talk to the experts. I'm gonna say you merge those two things. The reason I say that you're picking up your phone, you're either calling your, you're calling me because I am here local. I am a community home lending advisor here in the Houston area. You can call me and say, hey D, I'm ready to buy the home. I'm ready to get pre-qualified. I'm ready to see my pre-approval. The application itself takes about, I would say about 15 to 20 minutes. If you do it online, about 15 to 20 minutes. If we do it in person or over the phone realistically, it's a little bit longer in person, but that's going to take 45 minutes of your time to really decide, are you in a place right now in your life where you're ready to get in your car, call Lisa up and say, hey, Lisa, I want to see these five or six homes this weekend. If you can get a pre-approval, then yeah, you're ready for that. And one of the things sometimes I see customers, they're afraid of that application. And the question I get is, do you pull credit? I think pulling credit is very important. And yes, when you you should get a pre-approval that has pulled your credit. The reason I say that is how do you know where you're going unless you know where you're at currently? So if you're just kind of, it, it's great to see those numbers in those like portals, but until you actually get, are able to pull the credit, get the pre-approval, the pre-approval says thumbs up, you're ready to go, Gloria. You're just kind of guessing. Once you get your pre-approval, you get you head back home or you get off the phone with me and I say, congratulations, you hear, I'm going to email you the pre-approval letter. Now you're at home and you know your credit score, you know how much you can afford, you know you have this pre-approval letter. What's next? Now's the fun stuff. Now we're starting to look for finding your home. And again, I'm going to merge finding a home, we're working with an agent. Some of these steps you could do together in partnership. Some of it might just be, you know, maybe after work, you're sitting down and you're saying, okay, what do I want in a home? What do I want versus what do I need? Do I need to be, you know, less than five miles away from Beltway 8? Do I need to be in, um, I need to be in the sci or school district? Like all of those questions are things you write down on your paper and say, these are the five things I need. I have to have it. There's, there's no, you know, this is what I'm looking for. And maybe these are three things that I would love to have. Like I'd love to have a home with a generator. You know, we live in Houston, we've had issues. I would love that. Do I need it? Not necessarily. Do I want it? Absolutely. So as you're talking to your aide, now you're, you're on the phone, you're working with this local realtor and I and I totally agree with Lisa when she says you know you call up some of these numbers and they say um oh you can have access to the lockbox and see the home on your own I mean that's not someone really invested in you finding the right home so I think it is important that you work with a realtor that is your agent 
They represent you. They, they're making time to answer your questions. Um, they're showing you properties. They're familiar with the area. And I will say Chase has a great program. It's called Chase Agent Express. And essentially that program, if you utilize one of the realtors that's involved in that program, you can get up to $5,000 after you close. So that's an incentive that's available to you. Don't have to use that person. You could use whoever you want, but I do say use a, or work with a realtor that is invested in you getting into your home and they are familiar with the area that you're looking in. Um, <clears throat> now you have your realtor. What's next? You go visit a couple of houses. You've been out maybe three, four hours. You're working with a Chase Agent Express realtor. You visit that last home and that's the perfect home for you. This is the one. This is it. Well, now it's time to start making an offer. Um, in the making an offer process, you're, the realtor is discussing with you what the closing costs would be like, what, how much you're gonna put down as um, earnest money, um, what's your option fee? How much are you going to put down for an option fee? Option fee is a certain, and I'm not sure I may have missed this, option fee is a certain time frame that they allow you to pull the property off the market so you can do that inspection. You can kick the tires around. You can visit at night and see what the neighborhood looks like at night because you saw it on a beautiful Saturday, but does it look the same in the evening? You're doing all those things without the risk of losing your earnest fee because you've paid this small amount of money that usually is non-refundable for you to do this. Um, once you're like, okay, thumbs up. I like this house. You, oh, you've done the option. You've done the offer. What's next from there? Your, um, let's say your offer is accept accepted. Now, on this screen, it says apply for your loan. But I want to present to you that Chase, myself as a, as a community home lending advisor and a lot of other lenders actually would like for you to do this step a little bit early on. And what, I, what they mean by apply for a loan, they're talking about presenting your W-2s, presenting your paycheck stub, your tax statements, your bank statements, whatever is necessary, because sometimes I, I do loans sometimes where I don't necessarily need bank statements. I don't necessarily, and the reason I don't need them is because you bank at Chase already. Or if I can do a digital income verification, what that means is you have your paycheck deposited to your Chase account for a certain time frame. My system will try to verify all of that for you. That way we're asking for less documents. Now, there are other lenders that, of course, can do that as well, but these are all things that when it says apply for a loan on step seven, keep in mind, you can do that between step three and four. The benefit of doing that between step three and four is that once you find that home, instead of it taking 30 days to close, now it's only maybe maybe a week, maybe two weeks. We're, we, once the once the underwriter has done that initial review and says, you told us you make $60,000 a year, you've prevent, presented us with documentation that says you actually do make that. You, says, you say that you receive social security income, you've presented us with an award letter and we have verified you do receive that. You say you have $20,000 in, um, in your bank account, we have verified it with bank statements, you do have that. So we're checking out all these items that you presented to get your pre-approval letter and now we're, we have them all, we've looked at them, and now we can say, okay, you're conditionally approved. All we're waiting on is for you to find that house and that house makes the value. It makes the value of what you've offered to pay for it. So that means you put in a contract, you're asking them, you're saying, hey, I'm gonna buy this house for 250. Chase wants to know, or the lender wants to know that the house is actually worth 250. If an appraiser goes out and they say, you know what, you negotiate, your realtor is awesome, Lisa did her thing because this house is actually worth $300,000, that is great, that is awesome because you are buying a home that already has equity built into it. Um, the reverse can happen too because the, real, the appraiser may come back and say, hey, you negotiated 250, we think this house is only worth about 240. 
at this point, do not be shocked if this happens. It is not a dead deal. Do not worry about that. There are some options. You can renegotiate. Um, you can bring more money to the closing table. There's a lot of things that can happen. Or if it's a situation where the seller won't budge, you won't budge, maybe this wasn't actually the house for you and now you're looking at another property. If everything goes well, we are, you provide your documents, you are, appraisal comes in. And as Lisa said, you get that clear to close. Um, once you get a clear to close, your phone is ringing because we are scheduling closing. The escrow officer is calling you. Your realtor is calling you. I am calling you. We're all calling in one, say congratulations. We're ready to go. We're ready to get to that closing table. Um, once we get to closing, uh, step eight, it should take anywhere between, I've had it go as quickly as maybe 30 minutes. Those are very rare to closings that sometimes take a couple of hours. And if it takes a couple of hours, you're signing documents, maybe um, the escrow officer sends in all your documents that are signed and they discover there's something missing. Just do not freak out. Um, one of the things you'll see is if you're dealing with a professional, whether it's your realtor, your lender, everyone who's there at that closing, we've been there before, have some patience because we're going to get to the end of the day where that key is handed off to you and you are now a homeowner. Um, again, you sign the documents, they send the documents that you have signed, that the seller has signed back to the lender. The lender reviews all of those documents, make sure all the signatures are okay, nothing is out of place or missing. Once that happens, a funder is now involved and they will call you, well, not you, they will call the um, title office and say it's okay to fund. That is also another great call or great email because that means we have sent, the lender, Chase, has said, give them the money. We've loaned, the, we've given them that 225, released that money to the seller to close on the house. That happens, you get the keys, you're taking those really cool pictures that you see on Facebook that some of your friends and family have posted, and you're now a homeowner. Um, does the journey end there? No, because now you're a homeowner. There's other things now you have to kind of be, you have to be concerned with. That's homeowner's insurance. I will tell you a tidbit of advice. This is not Chase, but if you buy a home and it is not in a floodplain, Home, flood insurance is too cheap not to have it in the Houston area. So if you can do it, get flood insurance. I've been here for 13 right. years. It matters. But my point is the journey is not as long as you think in terms of buying your home. This is something that can happily happen as quickly as 30 days. From the time this conversation, if someone called me tomorrow and said, D, Lisa and you did a great presentation, I'm ready to go. And you got a pre-approval. There is no reason that if all those check marks are there, today's March 12th, there is no reason that if everything is there, your credit, down payment, even down payment, by the way, Chase has a grant program that we can allow, we can provide you with up to $7,500 to help you buy a home. Um, if you go on my website, all you have to do, I don't have my QR code, I was trying to look for it, but if you search Dede Wims and Chase, Dede, D-E-E, -E, D-E-E, -E, WIMS, W-Y-M-S. If you search that with Chase, you'll find my site. There are tools on there to help you figure out. But let's say you are interested in 123 Main Street. It's over in Summerwood. Zip code is 77044. You can plug in the zip code and it will show you all of the grants that you can utilize to buy that home. Now, does it just show you Chase grants? No, it shows you other grants that are available to purchase that home. So that's a great tool that you can use. But what I was saying is it's March 12th. Do I believe that some of you on this call could be a homeowner by April 13th, April 14th? Absolutely. And the first step is here. It's tonight. It's just about deciding to get some really good professionals to support you a good realtor, a good lender to start and hold your hands. That's why it's two people, one to the left, one to the right. We're walking with you, getting you to closing. That's all I have. And ideally, if you guys have some questions, I'm here to answer them. Um, some questions I will warrant, I will tell you if, the, if they are um, 
let's say questions that are kind of very personal, directed maybe just for you. We can have some one-on-one -on -one time. Feel free to give me a call and schedule some time, but I will answer as many questions as I possibly can. Thank you guys. I don't see anything in the chat as of now, Latasha. So if anyone would like to come off mute, maybe if you haven't typed your answer, uh, your question in the comment section. Um, I think we have, um, we don't have a question, but we have thank yous to um, Ms. Williams and um, Lisa for their presentation. Um, and I have to say thank you once again um, for the great work that you do. Um, one thing that you said, um, Didi, that I, I try to emphasize when I have one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals, just because the bank offers you a certain amount of money to purchase a home, like you stated, it, it may be, they may tell you you are approved for 350000 if you know, based on your budget and your family's budget, especially if you have kids, because kids are quite expensive. Yeah. So you really need to, even though they offer that amount of money, do what's best for you. What Make the decision based on what you know you have coming in and what you know, because you may not have added the $150 that you give your mother if she's elderly. You have to really consider that because one thing we do not want to do is set you up for failure. You have the sign in the pictures one year and then a foreclosure the next year. That's not what we want you to do. So you have to make the best decisions for, um, for yourself and your family. So thank you, Didi, for saying that. I was like, a light bulb just went off when you said that. I said, they really need to catch on to that, that you do not have to accept the full amount that you are approved for. Um, I think we may, do we have anything else? And I do have something else to say uh, in oh, reference yes. to um, the pre-approval amount. And I always tell my customers this, let's say I give you a pre-approval for 300,000. And I think Lisa may agree with me. You're pre-approved for 300, you run off with your letter, great. Now you found a house that's 275 and your realtor says, we're gonna offer 265. My suggestion, mine, and Lisa may agree, those sellers and the seller agent doesn't need to know you were approved for 300. Call mm. me back, send me a text and say, hey, can you update my um, pre-approval letter to show that I was approved for 275? This is a strategy because let's be honest, if they're offering 275, they're asking for 275 and you say 265, but they see your letter says 300. Oh no, we have two offers. You could do a full price offer. That doesn't necessarily have to be true, but if they if they don't know your don't show all your cards is my thing. So exactly. just keep that in mind. It's and then it's not like you lose the pre-approval. All I did was adjust your approved for what you're approved. If we play with that number throughout the process, not a big deal. I definitely I definitely agree with her. That is absolutely correct because it, again, it's a negotiating strategy. And, and that way, again, they're, they're, they don't see all your cards and that you can hold that. And, that. and then let's just say maybe if you're willing to pay, that's not what's in your budget. So it's always advisable to yes, is to ask your lender or DD and let them know, bring it back down and submit it with your the purchase price that you're offering. Okay, there are now two questions in the chat. One is how advisable is it to have your lawyer to reach your contract? And what is a formula to calculate what your monthly note would be? I can start on the first one with the contract. So it's always recommended definitely uh, to have an attorney if you would like them to read the contract because it is a legal and binding document. What you sign, the deadlines, the time, the money, 
Everything in that contract is legally binding and there are repercussions if you or the seller do not abide by them. So we de- yes, we definitely recommend if you, if you do have the option to have an attorney read it. However, and not, there's no however, it is, it is also helpful to have a well-informed and educated real estate agent that is aware of the contract and, and has thorough knowledge of them to assist you as well. But yes, definitely we uh, advise you if you so wish to have a lawyer to read the, con- the legal and binding document, which is the contract. I'll, I'll take the ans- I'll take the question on the mortgage payment in a calculation. I wouldn't say there's a calculation. I'm sure there is, but here's the thing with that calculation. There's a number that you're missing um, and that's your interest rate. And your interest, the reason I say it's missing is because the interest rate at seven o'clock right now, the interest rate that we had, and that's any lender at six o'clock this evening is not the interest rate that you're going to have necessarily tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. when the market's open. So I would say that your best bet is to go online and use the tools, all these websites, H.A.R., Chase has tools that you can plug in purchase price, down payment, and then you can either use the interest rate that they have listed there at, as what they say the interest rate might be today. If in this situation, let's say they say this is a person who has 680 credit and they're using um, that as the calculation for the interest rate at on that day. Now, another person might log in the same day and let's say their credit is 620, that interest rate is going to be different. So that means their mortgage payment is going to be different. So the easiest thing to do is going to be log on, go to chase.com, use those tools to plug in numbers. The other thing, if you don't want to deal with, you know, the tools or any of that, pick up the phone, call me. I, that's what I do. Call me and say, hey, D, and I don't care how many times you need me to do it. That's what they pay me to do. And that's how your lender should view the relationship with you. That's what we're here for. So if you need to call me once a day and say, hey, check rates, hey, check rates. Now, will I try to teach you how to do it online yourself? Yes, (laughs) but that's the teacher in me. (laughs) Can I do it for you? Absolutely. So just keep that in mind. I can't say there's a, I'm sure there is a, a, a calculation but the the one um, number you're missing would be what is the interest rate at that time based on your credit score at that time. And I say that to say also you can get a pre-approval today, right? And I give you an interest rate. Then two weeks later, you say, I found the house. If interest rates have gone down, your mortgage payments will go down if the rate is not locked. But the opposite again, if rates have moved up and you didn't lock the interest rate, your mortgage payment will be different. So just keep the, that in mind when you're thinking about those numbers. Is there, is there any more questions? I think it's mm-hmm. one more. Um, what is, what the, is current the current? Debt? Oh, go ahead. What is the current debt to income ratio for a conventional loan? The, it, the guidelines I believe right now is 35% on the debt to income ratio, but FHA gives us a little bit more movement, VA, but for conventional, it's 35%. And that also is available at chase.com. All right, I see one more. How do you lock in the interest rate? You lock in the interest rate by talking to your lender. There are lenders, Chase, that we can lock the rate before you even have a property, which is awesome. But I will say the market so far, rates have been going down. There's no guarantee that it's gonna continue going down because once you lock the rate, that's going to be your interest rate. Um, So that means if rates go down, let's say you don't have a property yet and you lock it for 90 days, if rates go down, that's going to be your rate. Um, There is a way of getting out of that. And there is also a way of a one-time free float down, but that gets into some details that I can discuss with you. We do a one-time free float down, but there's a timeline. You have to be ready to purchase a home. Um, Other than that, let's say you don't lock it before you find a home. Once you have a home under contract, you can lock the rate and then that's going to be the rate you have until closing. And normally that's what most people do, but you could like, let's say you were building a home and it wasn't going to be ready for the next 10 months and you thought, okay, the rate you thought the rates are going to go up. 
you can lock it so that 10 months from now, this is the rate that you have. All right. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so my question is this, like, um, let's say my lease is going to be up, like, uh, how far in advance, what, okay, let me just try to rephrase this, okay, let's say my lease is going to be up in February of 2025, when should I start the actual process, like, not the process of trying to gather the information, because I know I'll have all of that, but just, like, to get the, to, to reach out, start with the actual real estate agent and all of that, getting it going. Because my thing is, I would hate to have to be paying, you know, uh, apartment rent and then paying like a mortgage. So I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. Okay, I'll start off with that question first. So you said January 2025? That's just rough. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Uh huh. And rough you said what? I'm sorry. A rough estimate? Yes. Yeah. So, so what usually that happens is that let's say you do January 2025. And then after that, um, what you can do is, I would say probably in January, in, in probably in October, in October, I would definitely recommend that if you can start um, looking and get in contact with myself and with a lender. And then that way they can get to the process, because I think for about three months or so, is that when you can, your rate should be locked in. Is that correct, Didi? No, she, she can actually lock it a lot longer than that. But I would say, I agree with you with that timeline, October. I would say you start at least having the conversation with your lender. And then, of course, if you have a realtor that Lisa, go ahead and start having that conversation. You, um, you guys, we can actually all meet together and start having like planning out. Because, again, it's a big deal um, because one of the things you want to know is, with with your with our approval the conditional approval we can approve you up to 90 days i think at this time right so we got to time it do you want lease to be over on friday and then i move in same day or do you want to be i move in on monday and lease is over friday so there's some timing that we can do but definitely to start the conversation, if your lease is over January 25th um, of 2025, let's say towards the end, I, I would be comfortable with talking to you as early as October, absolutely. Right, okay. and, and that way, that way, Chelsea, is that it can coincide with your lease, with your lease uh, agreement ending, so that we'll, once we put it into a contract, so that, say for example, we actually start actively looking in, let's say December, right? Because it takes up typically about 30 days to close, right? And so that what we do is we put a closing day that coincides with your your lease uh, agreement. And let's say that's January 1st, right? So we get into at the end of, we start looking in November, December, we put it under contract. And then we put the closing date Let's say, for example, uh, December December thirty first. That way, you know for sure. And then you can also give your 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 leasing uh, the apartment complex the notice because you typically need like thirty to sixty day notice, correct? And so that way, you let them know that that you're moving out, and then so you can move from one to the other. And then also too, typically, uh, is that you also have a about a month time frame where you won't have one payment with your with your mortgage right so that'll give you a cushion before you actually make your your first payment so that's also something that that can help you um, make that transition from moving from renting into owning a home is that you'll have one payment that you won't have to pay until like the following month is that correct again too Didi? Uh, that is correct there is a certain time frame that you'll have quite a bit about a month be, depending on when you close it um one of the things i want to tell you it, october is definitely a good time are uh, chelsea your lease is definitely op over in january i gave you a rough it's it's the beginning of uh, 2025 i just said i just threw january out there but it's around okay. january and this might be a little bit too much information, but the reason I say that is um, property taxes are due around that time. And I've run into certain issues that I want. I want you to be prepared to have a conversation about taxes. It's really not going to affect you, but your closing disclosure, well, not your closing, your loan estimate is going to show some stuff that taxes that depending on what type of loan you're getting, whether it's conventional or FHA, as 
as Lisa and I have both said, buying around that time, the earlier you can have the conversation with your lender, the better, because there are certain numbers that you have to be aware of. It's not that they're going to be due from you, but sometimes I have first time home buyers who see those numbers and it freaks them out. So I'm telling you that to remember when you have the um, conversation in October and November, keep in mind your loan estimate will show you some numbers that you're not necessarily responsible for, but we are required to put it on the loan estimate. So just remember that, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, um, Chelsea, I'm gonna also um, piggyback on what they stated. If you're planning on using a program, you also need to take into consideration when you're doing your timeline, um, what is the requirements from that particular program? So it may take longer for you to, um, to get everything that you need to get for as paperwork, documentation, application, making sure that you qualify. It may take a little bit longer. So you really need to consider that depending on if you're planning on using a down payment assistance program. Okay. So okay. make sure that, you know, if, if right now, you know, if you have kids, if you could go ahead and start getting some of that paperwork together, that would be awesome. So you won't have to worry about that when it comes down to when you're ready, really ready to get into that home. Um, so Didi and um, Lisa, thank you all so much for piggybacking on um, that particular question. Um, I, I do have a question that comes up a lot. Um, if you get that pre-approval and you know how we are, we get excited, wanna, um, we already decorated the whole house, um, at least in our minds, and you have this credit card and you decide that you wanna go and purchase yeah. furniture. Should we do that? Uh, no, 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 please <laughs> leave the credit alone. If you, uh, unless, I mean, of course, if there's a situation where you absolutely have to use your credit card, totally get it. But sometimes the DTIs are so delicate that we don't want to yes. disturb things. So it's best to, the home is the goal. The home is the goal. What goes in the home, we can take care of that later. Close on the loan. I say even wait a day after. Not that I've seen it happen, but just just give some patience <laughs> to yourself and say, I'm gonna wait till after I close and you know, really take in the house before you go buy the extra stuff. But definitely leave the credit alone. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so when that agent that I was, I mean, excuse me, that buyer that I had mentioned, she bought something as small as a computer. That's how tight her debt to income ratio was that they approved her and she just went and put mm -hmm. a computer on her credit card and that just totally threw her over and she was denied on the day of closing. So remember the do's and don'ts. Always Ooh. talk to your lender first when it has anything to do financial related, even putting money in the account or taking money in the account or applying for credit, closing credit cards, any of those, anything financial related, job related, always ask questions to your lender first awesome. and even those even those um i i don't those type of credit lines that don't necessarily show up on your credit but it may show up on your bank statement keep mm -hmm. that in mind too if you know you're planning on buying a home and i and one of them that stands out to me is klarna i think it's called klarna credit klarna Keep in mind that it may not show up on your um, credit. I believe that's how it was explained to me. But if the underwriter sees it on your bank statement and it's something consistently, they're going to add that into your debt. So that's something just be careful with all of those things because you're thinking, oh, it didn't show up. So they're not counting it. But then you submit two months bank statements and they can see you have Klarna, you got Apple and every month. $150 comes out or $75 comes out. 
Now the underwriter may say, hey, what's this? And you send a letter of explanation. And if your DTI was like maybe two or three points, and sometimes the underwriter will even let me go a little bit affirm, yes, they might let you go a little bit above with certain exceptions. Maybe, you know, you have a certain amount of assets or something, but now we find a firm, we find Afterpay, we find Klarna, and now your DTI numbers are shot because you bought a bunch of stuff from, I don't know, Saks or whatever, <laughs> or Apple. Exactly, exactly. And I'm glad you all expounded on that. Um, do we have, did we have another question? Thought, oh, okay. Okay. I think, I think that is all that we have. Awesome job, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, and, um, Didi, you kind of like helped me go straight into our, um, upcoming events when you talked about taxes. Um, that is, and I'm going to show you real quick try to get this on um our next upcoming session um road rules what to expect we have two more sessions left in this series it is session three road rules what to expect it will be on march the 26th from six o'clock to 7.30, same time, same place, same format. Um, at this point, we will talk about taxes. We will talk about that good insurance. We will talk about HOA um, um, dues. Um, this is something you do not wanna miss um, because one thing about it is good to have the home, but there is a responsibility after you get in the home. And um, we want to make sure that you know about everything that you need to know about up front so you can make the best decision for you and your family. Session three, housing tune-ups. We will be talking about maintenance and care after ownership. After you've been in that home for five years, you may want to do some renovations. You may want to even sell your home. We will be talking to different individuals about warranties that you need to purchase that um, we were supposed to have an inspector on tonight, but he will be on for session four. Um, if you need, if you have questions about um, inspections, um, different type of warranties versus insurance, um, it's a lot of information, even down to the color of your walls in your home. If you're planning on doing um, selling your home, is it best for you to color every wall a different color? I would say no but we have the experts that will be there to tell you the reasoning behind um, all of this information. And that last session will be on April the 7th at 6 to 7.30, same format, same time. Um, and after all of this, even though it's not on the um, form, uh, we will have a resource fair. If you are looking to utilize any of the down payment assistance programs, including the city of Houston, we will have someone to talk about our down payment assistance program. Harris County, if you don't want to live in Houston, but you want to live in Harris County, they have a program that mirrors the cities of city of Houston program. Um, they will be there. Also, Seth, Agape, um, Agape, Agape, um, down payment assistance program will be there. Baytown um, down payment assistance program will be there. So we have a lot of upcoming information and we're doing this just for you. We want you to understand the importance of being a homeowner and the responsibility that comes behind it. So that is all I have. Now I'm going to give this over to my manager, Ms. Onika Porter, to give us the final remarks 
Martz. And once again, I say to Ms. Sims of Chase Bank and Lisa of Mitchell Realty, thank you so much for your time, your effort, your expertise. Um, it is definitely, um, it was definitely needed and you all did an awesome job. And I hope to have you all back for um, the fall. If not, I'm sure I see somebody in um, in your um, area, in your company that will be here to represent. So thank you once again for everything that you all have done today. You all have a blessed day and hopefully I will see you on March the 26th. Now I give it over to Miss Onika Porter. Thanks, Latasha. I would first like to thank our amazing guest speakers. We got a wealth of information tonight, and we really, really appreciate everything you guys brought to the table. We can't wait to partner with you guys again on our future events. Again, we really, really appreciate you for taking the time out to join us tonight. Thank you. I would like to thank the, uh, the people who came and joined to get the, the information that we offered. Please take the time to join us in some of our other events. You will continue to get a wealth of information when you join all the events that we offer. And lastly, I would like to thank my amazing team for always doing an awesome job. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.